Hey everyone, welcome to Geek Bomb Book Club. My name is Maud Garrett. I created Geek Bomb and I love reading and I want you guys to get involved with amazing books as well. Every single month we select a book, we get you guys to read it and then we get the author on board with the Google Hangout to talk about it. And this month's book is amazing. We have tried this a couple of times, haven't we, Scott? But you are here in the flesh via technology in the <laughs> room. Scott Lynch, thank you so much for joining us on Book Club. You're uh, very welcome. Now, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad it finally worked. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. so pleased. I know technology has made us its bitch lately, but you know what? Together we have strived. We are talking about your book, The Lies of Locke Lamora, um, but before we get stuck into that, I thought I'd just quickly introduce the other panellists on this book club. My name is Maud Garrett. I am Chief Bomb of Book Club, but uh, Book Club President is Shona. Hey, Shona. Hello. Really so, yeah, I... I um, uh, I suggested this book, and yeah, I'm really excited to talk about it. When did you first get the book, and uh, when did you read it? Um, so I first read it um, a few years ago. So I got into an e-reader a while ago. I'm using Kobo, and based on your current books that you buy and read, it likes to suggest other books. So for a while, this book, The Lies of Locke Lamora, kept popping up in my recommended feed, and I was like, oh, I don't know. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Geek <laughs> 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 yes, we are very welcome here. So yeah, the book um, <clears throat> kept popping up in my suggested feed, so I was like, okay, fine, this book, I keep seeing it, let's download it and read it, and I just fell in love. And um, on Book Club for the very first time, we have Tegan coming from Wollongong in Australia. How are you, Tegan? Same question oh, to you. Thinking. That's not a real place. That's <laughs> like the TV version of Australia. <laughs> At least I'm not trying to make you spell it, so... <laughs> I'm from Billandingus. You, you're, just, you're just having us on. That's right. <laughs> oh, wait, you're Australian too. I'm sorry, Maud. Okay, yes. Australia's a real place, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I read the book, I think, back in 07 or, or 08. And I, just, I really loved it because, unlike, I guess, most kind of fantasy novels, I liked that it wasn't really just medieval setting and I felt that it was a little bit Alexander Dumas and a little bit Pratchett, which I really liked, so... Two thumbs up from me. And coming in all the way from Helsinki, which is uh, currently 3.17 in the morning, they reached out, um, out to us because you actually retweeted one of our tweets, Scott. We have Alexandra and Vera. Hey, girls. Hello. Hi. Same question for us? Or? In the morning. Same question. Yeah, 3.17 mm -hmm. in the morning. So, funny story. Um, we can't do math. And we calculated that this would start at midnight our time. And we figured out about six hours ago that it was, in fact, <laughs> three in the morning. So <laughs> we were caffeinated and we had naps. Yeah. Um, we'll be OK. Do you want to start with the question? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm uh, doing the exact same thing. I, I plan to see the sunset. I, I'm sure I plan to see the yeah. sunset. Because I know what direction the Earth rotates. Um, I plan to see the sunrise <laughs> at this pond. So caffeination and naps are, are what's happening. Absolutely. Sunrise is in an hour here, so. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Um, lies, uh, I read Lies 2009. I found it in a magazine. It said swashbuckling, and it had a great cover, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went to the bookstore, read the first few pages, and bought it. Um, about two years ago, I was at a board game night at my friend's house, and I was asking him for book recommendations, and he was like, oh, have you read Scott Lynch? And I said, who the fuck is Scott Lynch? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I get that a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he was like, oh, yeah, he wrote this great book, Lies of Locke Lamora, and I said, that's a fantastic title. I'm sold. Um, funny story, uh, the friend who wrecked it to me still to this day has not actually read the book, um, which... I found out and yelled at him about. He's like, how dare you wreck me a book that you haven't read? That's just not polite. <laughs> right. friends with this person? I guess it's kind of cool in some other ways. And it Why is he still out. alive? <laughs> well, Get with the program. He's a challenge. He is a challenge. He keeps like claiming personal life stuff and bullshit like that. I don't really believe it, but you know. Uh, well, I actually was given the book 
um, for my birthday this year by my very dear mother. Uh, it's my mum and I that chat books all the time um, and it's, it's our thing. I'm actually going to try and get her to watch live from Brisbane, huh, mama? Um, but <laughs> uh, same, same sort of thing when Shona suggested Liza Blockamora, I'm like, what, this book that I've just gotten? So I smashed it out um, and I'm really, really excited to get stuck into it. Uh, but as you know, Geek Bomb is all about celebrating your inner geek. So, Scott, I thought I'd run by 10 really quick geeky questions with you to kind of get to unleash your inner geek. Are you ready? All right. Just first thing that comes into your head, let's go. What is your very, very, uh, well, I guess the first question is, do you game? Are you a gamer? <laughs> okay, that's okay. my I'm answer. Just <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite game console? Ooh, okay, my nostalgic favorite is the Super Nintendo, but currently in my house I have an Xbox 360. Right. Would you go Xbox uh, One or PlayStation 4? I will eventually go Xbox One. Why Xbox over PlayStation? Uh, game selection. If, if PlayStation shows me something really cool, I, I will um, you know, maybe bend to its whim as well. Mm, I thought maybe because you're a Nintendo sort of loyalist that the Xbox controller was yeah. a lot more similar to the 64. No. Um, um, okay, well, if you know, you're a real started. Nintendo loyalist, you'd have a Wii U. <laughs> <laughs> I I had I had a Wii and I had the, uh, the, the predecessor to the Wii. Um, ah, fuck! I'm sorry. The um, Nintendo, the Nintendo, whatever the hell it was, the Nintendo um, early early 2000s. I'm sorry. I'm I'm a senior citizen the, now. The I'm, GameCube. I'm in my thirties. The GameCube. Things break. The GameCube. The Nintendo uh, GameCube. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I had one of those too. So I'm a Nintendo appreciator, maybe not a Nintendo loyalist. Right. Okay. Like Mario and Luigi game. are not like sacked out drunk in my hotel room right now. Shut the fuck up, guys. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I just like what them, is... okay? We're just friends. <laughs> <laughs> there were more now questions. Now you know why he was late to the, the tunnel. Fan figures, start your engines. Yeah, right? <laughs> Mario slowly unclasped his overalls. Um, no, we're not going to go. Um, my eyes. What... <laughs> what is the best game you have ever ever played? Um, tabletop or video or? I'm gonna go with gaming console and then we'll we'll. we'll oh okay. Uh, oh, oh god, how could you ask me such a question? Um, okay. uh, I hate you, Maud. Um, <laughs> nice, great soundtrack, good game. Okay. I love that one side. What was the first book that you fell in love with? It was a book. <laughs> it was a book on shark attacks. I was in kindergarten. Oh wow! Oh, wow. Is... <laughs> I'm shocked. So, I wonder if that inspired a lot of the sharks that appear in Lies. <laughs> I I don't know. Are there sharks in my work? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was it was a paperback nonfiction collection of shark attack stories, because I, I had a really interesting childhood. I don't know what to say. Right. Okay. <laughs> have you seen a shark before? Like, you know, just out in the surf? I have TV. Um, in the surf, no. Not that I know of. You need Not to come directly. to Australia. Yes, yeah. yes. i got to come to Australia where everything tries to fucking kill you. Yeah, including us. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually fairly terrified of sharks, but the few times I've actually been in the ocean, I never thought about it. And then when I leave the water, I'm terrified of sharks again. I don't know how that works. <laughs> Okay. What is um? What is your favorite book in the whole world? What is the one book that if someone's like, I, who inspired you or what you would recommend? Scott Lynch's The Lies of Locke Lamora. He's so dreamy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't have favorite books. You don't understand. It's like you know, which, which of your, which of your thirty five hundred ch uh, children is your favorite? I don't know. Um, I could tell you. I uh, da, da, you, Okay. Um, I. My desert island list of books would be like 25 books long. So let's just say Moby Dick and keep it easy. Oh, okay. Nice. The flawless Classic. answer. Um, what, uh, tabletop wise, have you played Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, yes. What's your character? Tell me about your character. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm either Mr. Magic Man um, or, believe it or not, I'm Mr. Crawley around on the wall stealing things. Another shocker. I have an affinity for rogues. I, I don't know what to say for myself. I know this is strange and shocking, <laughs> but we'll get through this somehow. What are their names in it? I've got a half-elf thief called Lenka, so I'm all about the bag of holding and stealing as well. 
Do you actually want me to confess my D and D character names? Yes, I do. <laughs> well, they're, okay, they're they're also my my Oblivion and Skyrim character names. Um, but tr traditionally, when I play a a, a magic -y man, I, I I play an elf named Sheldaker. Um, which is a, a Sheldaker, which is a name that I stole from a Doctor Who New Adventures novel because I am a complete and thoroughgoing nerd. Um, and um, typically, um, I'm not going to tell you my rogue's name, sorry. It's, okay. it's Scott. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Morgante. Oh, Gante. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Who shows up as a god in my fiction? What can I say? That's pretty cool. Uh, progressing on to television, favorite series that you've watched that you have an affinity with? Um, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. I'm a huge fan of most things Doctor Who. I'm actually about a season and a half behind. Okay. I have issues issues with, with the newest of the new Who, but I'm still, in my heart, a huge Doctor Who fan. Ooh, what, what is that? Why is... Yes, I would. I would love to be recorded on video slagging Stephen Moffat for all posterity. That is exactly the sort of. Oh my God, it's a trap. Um, <laughs> I, I, have, I have serious issues with the with the, the writing and the construction of the series and uh, what the Doctor is and isn't. And I'm I'm hoping that uh, Peter Capaldi's tenure will will sort of turn things around. But you know, he's not writing the series. And because I'm a writer and an egotist, I focus on the writing and 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 blame everything on on. You know the writer or and the showrunner. Um, if sorry. Moffat, if Moffat got them off and the network asked you to jump on board as a series writer, would you? Oh. Um, I wish they would have done it in two. Well, no. See, being story editor for a, re uh, a new Doctor Who would have been like my dream job, circa 2004. But then I sold the novel. Um, right. And the thing is, I have no television background, so I can criticize all I like, but I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Right. And however much I might criticize, you know, the uh, Russell T. Davies and Stephen Moffat and whatever, I mean, the, the fact is that they presided over the resurrection of something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm always going to be grateful for that. I think Moffat is a brilliant individual episode writer who does not necessarily have the perspective necessary to be a showrunner, and he's really fucking terrible with female characters. There, I said it. <laughs> Do you feel liberated? <laughs> I, I feel like this is going to be on YouTube eventually, and Stephen Moffat is going to be like, Scott Lynch, who the fuck is this? <laughs> Eradicate him it's from just, space. It's just constructive feedback. That's all this is. That's it's all the just, internet yeah, yes, ever is. Yes, I am. <laughs> Can I just ask something about the Who related, quickly, if I may? Sure. Um, were you a fan of the 1980s one? Maybe, for example, I don't know, Tegan Jovenga, who I was named after? Yes, I, I I noticed Tegan. Actually, I was I have to admit I was a bigger fan of Nissa. Nissa, rah. Um, <laughs> Tegan was a fan of Nissa. I get it. She was, she was uh, a fan. I'm also a redhead lab. I, I I I I discovered Doctor Who when I was um, 11, which would have been 1989, um, because I'm old and broken now. And um, Jesus, I'm probably the oldest person in a podcast. Hi, kids. Hi. Yeah, there was Doctor Who back in the 80s. Um, I, uh, I discovered it at the local library through the novelizations. I discovered it totally ass backwards. Um, I did not watch the show first. I read the books. And then when I watched the show, it didn't match up with what was in my head. Um, but, but yes, I discovered it through that, that American uh, magic of PBS, um, where we take British shows and show them years afterward, and uh, entirely new generations of Americans get infected by them. So I was a fan of old school who it was actually dying at the exact moment I was discovering it. <laughs> and I, I didn't know this. I didn't discover this for years. Right. And uh, the one last funny geeky question that all of Geek Bomb puts out to everyone. We play a little game called Power, and it's P-W-R. What you are playing, what you are watching, and what you are reading. Go for it. Um, okay. There is an embarrassing amount of Fallout New Vegas uh, possibly happening on my Xbox lately. Not not actually all that recently because I'm getting ready to go to to Finland, um, where where some people are already gathering because we're going to do this this cult thing. And um, no, there, there 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 are several novels that will never be written that are actually sunk into Fallout New Vegas. I've played that wow. game to death, past death, resurrected it, killed it again. <laughs> And uh, we'll probably someday play it again. Um, what am I watching? I'm not watching a fuck of a lot at the moment. Um, I, my girlfriend and I occasionally watch Leverage when we can. Um, she introduced me to that, and we are still embarrassingly early into its run. Um, and what was the, the third? What are you reading? Oh, <laughs> reading. I remember when I had time to do that. Um, <laughs> 
I am I am presently reading um, Sam Sykes's uh, City Stained Red, which is his forthcoming uh, fourth novel, and a whole bunch of research material for finishing up Thorn of Emberlane, which is my forthcoming fourth novel, um, and a bunch of stuff that Elizabeth Bear wrote because she writes about a billion things a week. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey guys, if you are watching this, play at home, PWR, what are you playing, watching, reading? This is a completely interactive stream. If you are watching this, there's a comment box under the video. Write your questions in. I'll be monitoring those questions and we'll be asking Scott directly. So I would love to hear from you. Um, but let's get things started. Shona, over to you. Let's talk about all things the lives of Locke Lamora. Okay. Well, I thought maybe we'd just start with a couple of questions about first how you got into writing, Scott. So you mentioned that you sold the novel in 2004. So mm -hmm. how did that all start? Um, by accident. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> accident and incompetence. Incompetence followed by accident. Um, because I spent most of my, my high school years, most of my early development, thinking um, that I was going to be a comic book illustrator. That was my great delusion in high school. Um, unfortunately, my art hit a plateau. And the, the only wisdom I had at that age was the wisdom to realize that I truly sucked as an artist. <laughs> um, so writing was writing was plan B. Um, and it turned out that writing was something that I could actually do and uh, persist at. And so a mere 11 years later, um, I sold my first novel. Um, and before that, I was doing um, freelance stuff and self-published stuff um, in the D20 world, role-playing stuff, um, to you know not die um, while I was working on the novel. And... Um, I'd, I'd uh, been working on the novel for a couple of years and was getting fairly serious about it, and whoa, Maud just went all over the place. Um, Sorry, I'm drunk. Maud is a time <laughs> Lord, okay. Um... I had I, I I okay sorry this, this is this is this is the too, everything I give you is the too long didn't read version. How do you get liquor? Send me some. I, I'm in a fucking con. I don't have liquor. What the hell? Um, you have a mini bar fridge. Right, that shit. Well, I, I don't. I don't. It's it, it's 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 the law here. The con cannot provide liquor. It's the one thing. It's not that there's not liquor coming out of everybody's orifices here. All it's all over the place. But the con cannot technically provide it. Because Americans, we're stupid. I don't know. I don't know what to say. Anyhow, so I was telling a story before I was derailed by whoever did it, one of you. Um, I, uh, I, I was part of a message board, which was full of mouthy young 20-somethings all talking shit about what fantasy should be and what the field needed and blah, 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 blah. And um, there was an actual writer who was a member of this message board named Matthew Woodring Stover, who's kind of my, my mentor figure. Um, he's the little angel perched on my shoulder telling me to, you know, keep fucking writing. And... Um, we were doing our usual bitchy mouthy thing, and he finally wrote in to say, "Look, you little fucks." Um, I'm sorry, but whenever Matt is invoked, everything gets really sweary all of a sudden. Um, language he's warning. He's kind of where I got it from. <laughs> <laughs> fucking language warning. I'm really fucking sorry. Um, <laughs> Matthew Woodring Stover um, wrote us all a note, um, in which he said, "Look, I love you all, you stupid lunkheads, but um, I'm a prof professional writer. I write books, and uh, where are your books?" Uh, we've been bitching about this stuff for two years now, and it's it's critique this, critique that. We ought to do this. We ought to do that. Are any of you actually writing something? And so I said, okay, sure, sure. I'll show you what I'm working on. Um, so I showed a couple of these people what was uh, the prologue to The Lies of Locke Lamora, which was basically all that existed. And they all went, hmm, okay, all right. Well, you're not a total loser. Um, and that was basically it. Unbeknownst to me, one of these guys was an associate of the gentleman who is now my editor over in London, Simon Spanton at uh, Galance, uh, a division of Orion Publishing. And he forwarded uh, the location of the blog where I posted this. And um, yes, this, this was the blog age, the dark age before Tumblr. Um, <laughs> we, had, we had to post everything manually on sheepskin and then scan it in with sticks. It was fucking crazy. Um, <laughs> He, he contacted Simon and said, Simon, you should really look at this. And Simon looked at it, and it, it, it bit him. He, he, he sent me an email out of the blue and said, I'm an honest-to-God publisher in honest-to-God England, and I'd like to, honest-to-God, look at more of what you have. And when I picked myself up off the floor, I said, I don't have anything else to show you. Um, so I wrote the first chapter of The Lives of Locke Lamora. I wrote it really fast and sent it in. And he said, wow, that's awesome. Okay, I'd like to make you an offer on the book. And then when I picked myself off off the floor, I said, that's literally it. There is no more book. And he said, we can work around this. Um, you, know, you, 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 could, you could finish this in about three months, right, Scott? And I'm like, sure, I can finish in about three months. And Well, you know how that turned out. Um, so my first novel was published in 2006. Um, I'm really good with time. I'm I'm Mr. Deadline. <laughs> that, well, that is how I, I became impressed. a writer. <laughs> I would have been super impressed if you'd done that in three months. No, 
No, I, yeah. I, I didn't actually do that in three months. I, so I, I think, think I fin- all of us. Uh, I was gonna say, I think all of us are really dying to know exactly where Locke came from. So, how did you come up with this character? This whole interview is designed to make me look like a gigantic freaking nerd, isn't it? Um, because but, okay. we're all uh, gigantic. Freaking 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 <laughs> we're all. <laughs> um, okay, Locke was um, a role-playing character. Uh, Locke was not a Dungeons and Dragons character. Locke was a character I played briefly in a Star Wars role-playing game. Um, I think that's the only way I can possibly score more nerd points than Dungeons and Dragons. Um, no, I don't know it, this game, okay, this game lasted like two sessions. It was one of those, you know, one of those things that happens when you're a gamer is a friend invariably says, yeah, let's play a game, we'll start something awesome, and it lasts a session, you never hear of it again. Repeat 79 times, you have essentially my college years. Um, I played this character who was uh, a sort of uh, a latent force sensitive, a half-assed Jedi, um, a psychic, as it were, who was sort of a secret agent, diplomat, smuggler, raconteur, who was uh, in the service of the the intelligence service of this tiny little out-of-the-way planet that had no other set of defenses. They just had this tiny little crew of essentially con artists who would go out into the greater galaxy and deflect incoming harm from this tiny little world that did not want to be overrun in Great Galactic Wars. And the game tanked, but the character concept stayed with me. Um, and from this... Uh, it basically evolved Locke Lamora as we now know him, minus supernatural powers. Wow. Okay. So, because these guys are con artists, I'm guessing these were the precursors to the gentleman bastards. Um, but how do you find the balance between? I mean, at the end of the day, they're criminals. They're robbing people. They occasionally kill people. But yeah, I was reading them as the good guys. So how do you find that balance to make you know these bad guys likable? Is that hard? Well, p- part of what I was setting out to do was you know I, I wanted to write um, you know in, in part at least a gangster movie, a classic gangster movie, you know the Martin Scorsese or Brian De Palma style gangster movie as a fantasy novel. And part of the the interest in these movies, part of the the emotional ride, is that dichotomy between. I'm really, really involved in their story, and these guys are really murderous fucks. Um, you know, I mean, if you watch something like Goodfellas, I mean, it's absolutely compelling, but it is... And there's Maud again, having more fun than the rest of us. Um, <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, your, your, your vertical hold and your... Okay. Um, I'm only taunting you because I'm sober, and I shouldn't be at this point. <laughs> It's, it's, um, a, it's actually it's, 10.37 for us in Australia, and that was a cup of tea that I had, not a shot of whiskey, but... Oh, I'm, I'm so disappointed. I'm, I'm, I'm just jealous. Um... Yeah, it was. It was. Um, you know, I, I wanted them to to have come from the, the, the criminal class, to have come from the criminal underworld, because in this sort of world, um, I mean, you have this rigidly classist society where essentially you've got the aristocracy and you've got the merchants, you've got those with money, and then you've got everybody else, and everybody else is fucked from birth. Um, there's very little okay. social mobility. There's no uh, sense of commonality or popular education. There's really no way to lift yourself up out of the dirt, except through a couple very, very exclusive paths. I mean, you can go to war and hope for glory. Um, but you're most likely to get killed. I mean, you can't really be a son of a fishmonger in this world and grow up to be, you know, a head of a major university. It just r- rarely happens. Um, and, and, you know, this is a Renaissance Elizabethan type social development uh, uh, pattern, so it's relatively gentle compared to what it would have been even earlier. Um, the only freedom, you know, ironically enough, that these characters could have was by being outside the class system entirely, by being crooks, by being in the underworld. And um, that's just one of the themes that I wanted to explore is that, yes, they're bad people, but in a sense, they're the only free people um, who don't have titles in front of their names. Mm, True. And then with a lot of the schemes that they come up with in the book, I mean, some of them are really complicated and ingenious. So I'm wondering, is there like a criminal mastermind inside your head, Scott? (laughs) Um, Wow, there's, 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 okay, there's things I can't talk about in a podcast. Um, How many states are you wanted in? (laughs) I was a juvenile. It was expunged from my records. I really like stainless steel rat novels. Let's just say there was an incident. Um, He's also a right now. <laughs> um, you know, the, the the crazy thing is 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 that okay, I was I was a mischievous little shit when I was a teenager, but my social conscience sort of hit me like a brick to the head later on. I'm actually a very boring, respectable sort of community minded type, very long haired, fantasy writing, heavy metal listening geek. Um, you know, I, 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 I belong to a fire department for Christ's sake. It doesn't get more boring than that. I mean, I'm, 
I'm 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 not Locke. Um, well, that's Locke why we, my... we play games, and that's where you know you would pour that outlet through your writing, wouldn't it? Oh so... yeah, yeah, well, yeah. In, in, in Skyrim, I you know I'm motherfucking death on a shoestring, swooping <laughs> here and there and everywhere, stealing yeah. everybody's <laughs> cheese and putting it in people's basements. I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 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 a vicarious voyeuristic stealthy motherfucker. And you know, back when I played uh, World of Warcraft, I was a total PvP shithead. I mean, sneaking around. As a rogue, stabbing people in the back was... Oh, I'm, I'm admitting a little bit too much about myself here. I like fucking with people. It's amazing. Um, yeah. But in real you life... You killed me in World of Warcraft. You uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I, I, it, the, 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 the fun and ironic part is that uh, my, my warlock in, in World of Warcraft, my heavily PvP character, uh, was named Falconer, uh, which should have been a hint to everybody. <laughs> So, which um, of your of the gentleman bastards do you identify with the most? Then, so would that be Locke, mm. <laughs> or is there a bit of yourself in all of them? Um, okay, well, here's the thing: is is that Jean is the most stable and sane and capable and sexy and beloved and. I'm so glad uh, that you just said Jean because we weren't sure if it was yeah. going to be Jean like or Jean, Jean or Jean, how to pronounce Jean. it. Uh, it in my head, it's Jean, and in anybody else's head, it can be whatever you want, because my mom and my grandmother always say Jean. My mom and my grandmother, who both took French in high school, they should both damn well know it's Jean, but it's it's Jean. And then it's it's Tannen, rather than the French pronunciation of Tannen, because reasons, God damn it, I don't know. In, <laughs> in my head, Jean is Jean, and... Um, I want to say Jean. Jean's got some of my, my, my better traits, but really, I mean, Locke has more of the authorial self-portrait. Locke is, is definitely more stubborn, more fixated, more fucked up, um, and more... Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm like a more stable and socialized version of Locke, minus about 50 IQ points and a lot of desperation. <laughs> so, yeah, it's interesting that you said John. Now I'm going to have to start calling him John now. Um, yes. He's the most beloved because he's my favorite gentleman <laughs> bastard. I just wanted to ask the other guys on the panel, who was your favorite? Absolutely, John. John. Absolutely, <laughs> John. <laughs> okay, except that's not true. I actually love Sabatha best more than anyone else in the entire world. But John is like this far I, I know that you're not cosplaying as John, so I had some oh, suspicion. Oh, yeah, like, <laughs> Totally not cosplaying John next weekend. No, that's not happening. I am cosplaying Sabbath next weekend, though. But there's still time to turn that into a Jean costume. I'm just saying. Oh, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's what you need. <laughs> you need more stress, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you. I think I can say I love Father the Chains as well. Love him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Chains. He was really interesting. He's the kind of guy I would love to like sit down with and have a beer and just listen to him tell stories about his life. Yeah, I think it's because immediately from the outset, when you know you find out that he can actually see, I don't know. It just because again back to the Pratchett. He seemed like such a Pratchett sort of character. I, just, I don't know. I just loved him. It was great. Well, it's 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 that Willy Wonka thing, you know. It's it's Gene Wilder as Willy Wonka in in his movie version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when he he comes out pretending to be a crippled old man and then does a somersault and you realize that nothing about this guy um, can be taken at face value. Everything he says could be a lie. His whole life is imposture. And um, you, you, you I, I think in, in chains, if I may be allowed to comment on my own genius, because it's not like I did this consciously, it really fucking happened. Um, you know, happy accident is, is half of, of literary achievement. The other half is heavy drinking. Um, chains is that combination of the Willy Wonka sort of unpredictability and the, the gruff and gravelly, no-nonsense father figure um, that you know the found family really needs. So you 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 get to have um, you get to have it both ways in him. He gets to be um, both unpredictable and roguish, and yet uh, a source of stability in these characters' lives. So I think that kind of makes him a very attractive package. As a yeah, character. would you ever consider exploring more of his past? Because we've got all the flashback scenes where we look at when Locke was young. Um, and obviously in the present day, Chains is dead, but would you ever look at going back to when Chains was young and when he was active, I guess? I, I have given this a lot of thought, and I, I've, been, I've been wrestling with this question for a couple of years, um, because I'm on the hook, after, after I finish uh, The Mad Baron's Mechanical Attic and uh, The Choir of Knives for Billet Subterranean Press, I owe him one more novella, which will hopefully turn into more novellas. And what I've been toying with is the backstory of certain characters. 
And there are characters whose backstory I really want to tell, and there are characters that I kind of want to leave in shadow. And I'm afraid at this point that Father Chains is one of those characters that I'm just sort of veering toward leaving unwritten. Hmm. Um, maybe I might show a few more incidents from his past, but I'm not sure I want to reveal everything about him. Um, in part because I don't know everything about him as yet. And sometimes when you start exploring those that, that sort of thing, um, you end up conjuring something which is really lame and boring and, and no fun. So there's there's yeah, no like I, super secret magical revelation that I'm hiding there, um, if that makes yeah. sense. But um, I, I really want to explore uh, Zamira Drakasha's backstory, um, if, if, if Bill will eventually let me. And I think that's what hopefully the third untitled Gentleman Bastards novella will turn into, is uh, maybe a two-part... Zamira Drakasha before she was Zamira story. I haven't read the other two books. Well, you need to get oh, on that. Oh, okay. Do it before the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick question about Father Chains. Um, do you know his real name, and are we ever going to find that? <laughs> uh, yes and no. Ah, it is. <laughs> <funny. There. laughs> Just, just say it really quietly. I know it, we yeah. don't tell anyone. I, I keep it in my pocket right here. I'm looking at it now. No, I you can't see it. Sorry. I Ooh. promise that none of us are Bonds Magi. We won't like use evil powers over his name. No, nope, sorry. I'm not gonna. No, no. They're, 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 some some things I, I I just have to stay a taunting bastard about. I'm afraid that has to be one of them. <laughs> yeah, the term bastard does get flown around a lot. <laughs> that's that's odd. That's really odd. Where I'm concerned, it's very strange. I'm, I'm such a straightforward and non-games playing sort of author. I, I just I can't imagine where that reputation comes from. <laughs> uh, uh, my favorite character was the I, spider. Innocent face. Innocent face. Uh, the spider that was kind of like um, keeping the town in order, and then you, it was revealed to be a sort of like an old woman. I thought that was really cool. An old woman who likes to slap people. She, I really kind of resonated. And with stab her. them with knitting needles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like wish I was. Identities? I wish I was tweeting because the fact that your secret identity is an old woman who likes to slap people is totally awesome. That should be that should be the quote on your tombstone. Um, <laughs> she she was yeah. Uh, Dani Vorchenza, Angie Vesta Vorchenza was just so much fun to write mm. because I mean really she was it was it was it was like what if my grandmothers were um, you know in, in in charge of the CIA. Um, what if my grandmothers were secretly working behind the scenes and, and you know killing people and keeping the city in order? Well, you know that's actually not far from what a grandmother in a large family does. Mm. Um, I, I I think of of all the various pleasures of of writing the lies of Locke Lamora after actually finishing it. Um, Donya Vorchenza was by far all of my favorite bits involve her. Mm. Yeah, oh, my favorite and. Character. Yeah, and it, I, I thought that was a really cool twist as well. Because um, I saw, a, I actually, after I read the book and I was preparing for the book club, I jumped onto Goodreads and I had a look at what other people were saying about the book. And I saw a few people complaining that it was a bit of a boys' club, you know, that it was very male focused. There weren't many female characters, and, you know, the potential ones like uh, Nazca Basavi. She killed her off! off. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how that happened. I'm not, I, 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 I okay. Um, you no, know, it's 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 true. I mean, in 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 absolute terms, I mean the the female portion of the cast of the Lies of Locke Lamora is actually very small. Um, and here's the here's the thing about that is is that you know we we write in reaction to and um, uh, under the influence of everything that we grow up reading, everything that we we come out of, and the environment that I came out of. I mean, to be perfectly frank, my my primary model as a fantasist was was Ray Feist, and there are many things that Ray Feist does well, and many things he doesn't do so well. And one of the things he doesn't do so well is put very many useful or interesting female characters into his work. So when I was writing the Lies of Locke Lamora, um, simply bumping the number of, of you know active female speaking parts up to the relatively low number that exists was you know still a huge improvement on most of the shit that I'd grown up reading. Um, when you'd basically have you know all male cast a book and then featuring girl or you know guest starring the crazy aunt. I mean, are there any well, women the, the in the Belgaria who aren't? Polgara, I, I mean, shit. Um, but yeah, I mean, com compared to the books that came later, and compared to books that are, you know, like Lies is now ten years old. Um, wow. If people have only read, um, yeah, Lies is now ten. Well, okay, I finished it and turned it in in two thousand five, so Lies is nine. Um, so we're not quite there yet. But you know, time has still moved on, and and the paradigm has shifted, and you know, we've. 
uh, we've begun to accept you know crazy notions like the thought that women might be people and they like to read books and they like to see themselves in books. And, and who then knows you find where yourself on a panel with all females. Yeah. <laughs> when you die here. And the, the, the thing is, I, I mean, I, I, I see where people are coming from when they say that. I mean, yes, Lies is still a very masculine book, probably the most masculine book I will ever write, unless I write a book on the actual mafia or something like that. Um, and I mean masculine simply in terms of its, its, its uh, cast uh, breakdown, because I, I, I don't apply um, gender essentialist bullshit like this book is masculine, this book is feminine. I, I, I just, you know, that would make me want to slap people. Um, the, uh, the the thing is is, is that you, you you make your mark with um, your, your starting point. You know, lies is lies is my first attempt at a novel, and um, you know you, you move forward from there. And where I was at in two thousand four, two thousand five, in terms of the the inclusivity, the plurality of, of what I was working on, and what I knew or didn't know about what I had to include, well, that has evolved since then. Um, I would write lies differently. Um, were I writing it now, um, but I'm also a little proud of it. Um, relatively speaking, incredible. compared to its. <laughs> that, that's well, your I mean, first I'm, novel. Obviously, I'm proud of it. It's a heartbreaking work yeah. of staggering genius. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it for what it is. I mean, I get an awful lot of mail from people who say thank you, you know, with the lies for for the lies of Locke Lamora for for doing this with women and doing that for women. And the crazy part is, is that that is not the book that has a great many women in it. They just have important things to do. Um, my my favorite fan letter of all time is is the one from someone who who pointed out. Um, the big secret of the lies of Locke Lamora, which is that it's the female scientist at the end of the day who literally saves the day. It's not Locke, and it's not Jean, and it's it's not even the spider, it's not everybody else. It's um, Doña Sofia Salvara, um, who saves the day with science, or the Camori equivalent of science, which is, you know, not quite science. And she wore um, the pants in that relationship, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so Sofia and Lorenzo, yes, yes, yes. Um, we're going to see more of them. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see more of their domestic life um, at, a, at a fairly soon date. Um, oh, so, yeah, fantastic. I, at a fairly <laughs> soon in the future. Um, so yeah, you know, it's 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 undeniably true that that the um, you know lines could have more female characters. Um, I, I I guess I, I I feel proud of the fact that most of the fantasy fiction written in the three or four decades preceding lies barely fucking had any. Um, Tolkien, so. like nothing. So. Mm. Uh, Tolkien elves reproduce by sporulation is what we de we decided. They step into sunbeams and spores pop out. Um, <laughs> yeah, we we just we, you know, we 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 crawl before we walk, and you know the whole artistic process is ideally a process of learning and improving. Um, I'm I'm pleased with the way the lies turned out. It could have been better. Um, I've tried to do better since. Um, Hold on. But all things uh, considered, I didn't think I did bad. How many other authors are really kind of pissed off at you that your very first book that you wrote, you got kind of published or guaranteed a publishing deal after your first chapter? All like, of them. They? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Uh, like I said, this is not how it usually happens. It really isn't. Um, I, was, I was on a panel, the, the first panel I was ever on with another published author. Um, and she told that you know we, we got the so how did you get published you know question as in if everybody comes up, and um, she told the classic well I lived in a garret for 15 years and I you know gathered garbage to live and I scribbled things for I mean she told the horror story you know I was able to finally afford enough coffee filters so I could write my book on the back of the coffee filters and then type it up at the public library and send it in and sell it for peanuts so I didn't starve that winter. And then there's me, and I'm like, well, I posted a chapter on the internet, and some dude bought it, and <laughs> the death glare that I, I, I you know, I, I, I thought that glaring daggers was just a cliche until it actually <laughs> happened. <to me. laughs> if, if looks could kill, she would have blown my fucking head off at precisely that moment. Um, we, we later talked about this. I mean, you know, because it, it was, it was, um, you know, here I was stepping up, and it's like my, my publication story is basically, you know, uh, some watery tart threw a sword at me. Is is how I was personed, you know. That's how I that's how I got supreme executive power. Um, it's usually not that easy, but the part that always gets left out when I when I when I tell this story. Um, and I've seen this happen at fucking panels. I will tell the story of how I was published, and I will see it in people's eyes that everything up to. Um, you know, I got published is like Charlie Brown adult noises, mwah, 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 yeah. mwah, and then I got published. Um, because the part that gets left out of the story is the fact that I decided I wanted to be a professional writer when I was 15, and I worked at it for less than years, which is still a very short fucking period of time, all things considered. But I worked at it for 11 years and wrote thousands and thousands and thousands of pages during that time. So 
that's, I mean, that's, that's about what it takes to become an overnight success. You can become an overnight success very easily in 11 to 15 years. Huh. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's interesting then. So you might not have gone out and written other novels, but you still were writing a lot. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I was, I was um, well, I, I, did, I did a whole bunch of uh, game stuff, and um, cleaning that up and editing it and, and actually getting it into a finished uh, product form was, was very, very useful in that it taught me how to actually finish a fucking project. I was not a very tightly wrapped package when I was in early 20-something. I was uh, very much a lost-in-my-own-head sort of flake, mm-hmm. and learning work habits in the writing world was, was Basically, there'd be no Lies of Locke Lamora without my role-playing work to lay the, the foundation for that. But I was also writing really shitty fiction in the background all the time that I don't show to people because it is incredibly, incredibly deadly to the human intellect and will make you stupider if I even show it to you. Oh, just a little little bite of one particular thing that happened. Are we talking Fuck dragons? No. Are we talking? <laughs> um, I, I, I had I had an embarrassing uh, Edgar Allan Poe phase when I was about eighteen, where I got this red notebook that I still keep to shame myself every time I'm every time I'm feeling really good. I get the red notebook, and it's like, okay, shit, there's still room for improvement. Um, <laughs> this contains. My uh, counterpoints to Edgar Allan Poe's classic stories and my attempts to modernize them, this is about as successful as it sounds uh, coming from an 18-year-old from suburban Minnesota. Um, But I keep the notebook as as my secret albatross, my secret shame, um, just to remind myself that, you know, you're not such a fucking genius, dude. Um, Keep working. Right, so it's and a I am, I am never showing this fucking thing to anybody. It's going it's going in my coffin with me at my Viking funeral, so we will all burn. <laughs> in my stupid words, burn, burn, burn. <laughs> Posterity can keep the good ones. The red notebook goes away. Red notebook. So what um, advice would you have for other aspiring authors then? Law school. Buy a um, red <laughs> <laughs> buy, buy a red notebook. Um, the, 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 the advice I always give, and, and it sounds really obvious, but you'd be startled by how many people just don't think of it like this, is read. Read the fuck out of everything. Read everything in the genre that you want to write. Read everything outside the genre you want to write. Read hungry. Read like your life matters on it. In the two years prior to uh, turning in the lies of Locke uh, or I should say selling it, um, I was engaged in a really, really strenuous project to sort of devour as much genre fiction as I possibly could. Um, I read all the Hugo Award winners, all the Nebula Award winners, all the World Fantasy Award winners, and a number of the finalists in all these categories, plus um, some Tip Tree winners and uh, various other uh, awards. And uh, I was reading upwards of 100 novels a year, just, you know, bam, 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 two or three of them a week. And unfortunately, I can't maintain that pace um, these days because I'm old and busted. Um <laughs> And have to actually write books these days and travel, which just kills it. But um, you've, you've got to read voraciously. And you, you have people who have this notion in their mind of, I want to be a writer, but to them it's, it's just this wonderful abstract. They don't realize exactly how much uh, mental work lies behind um, you know, anyone who makes it look easy. Um, everyone can write um, to, to some extent. You know, we can all write letters. We can all write text. We can all write emails. So the assumption is, oh, anybody can write, but that's you know patently not fucking true. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a number of published science fiction and fantasy professionals who can't fucking write. <laughs> um, Merritt's got nothing to do with it. Um, they turn their books in on time, and they're pleasant to work with. How do you think Kevin J. Anderson turns out 78 novels a week? Oops, I said it out loud. Um, he's a lovely person despite the fact that he can't write. <laughs> but he'll, he'll hit a deadline, which is yeah. something that, that there's there's um there's the, the the Neil Gaiman continuum as he's described it is if you want to be a professional in this field um there there are three possible things you can hit uh you can be good um you can be pleasant to work with you can hit your deadlines and if you can do any two of these things you have a viable career if you do none of them you're going nowhere if you do all of them you're a saint these people don't okay elizabeth bear exists she just walks into the room um she hits deadlines is wonderful to work with and is a very Did you say good she writer. walked into the room yeah she walked into the room she's right over here. really my my real girlfriend is is not from canada she's real she's here um she's she's off to the side <laughs> um, this, the, this is our, our uh, glorious hotel room at Convergence in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, but uh, many of us uh, stumble through um, merely hitting two of these things rather than three. If you are um, pleasant to work with and hit your deadlines, nobody will give a shit whether you're good or not because you're still useful to publishers and editors. If you are good and pleasant to work with, you can get away with not hitting your deadlines like certain people I could mention. 
<laughs> um, and certain bearded fantasists I could mention. You don't. You don't have to be. The 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 triumvirate ad ad advice is actually really really applicable. It, it's uh, you know not that I want to encourage people to deliberately fall down in one of these categories. It's just a reminder that you know what you don't have to be perfect. You just have to provide a function, fill a niche. There's a number of niches that editors and publishers need. If you push enough of these buttons, you can have a career. Um, your niche exists out there. It's it's just that you've got to plug yourself into it. Um, to use a really crude metaphor. <laughs> so then, um, really just... crude. It's crude and unfortunate metaphor time. In you end. Let's go. Well, we could, uh, talking about you know crude and unfortunate things. Um, and also we're talking about the cursing before. I mean, some of the cursing in the book is really creative. Um, some of them just had me laughing out loud. So, I mean, I'm guessing that. You're quite like that in real life. Are you very creative with your um, when you when you do curse and that? And give us some I, examples. And that's a threat. I do swear perhaps a little bit too much in my personal life. Um, I, I can try to tone it down um, around you know depending on where I am. Um, the, th the thing is, is is that I don't happen to subscribe to. Um, any assignment of moral value to vulgar language. Um, I don't think it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's a sin. I don't think it's anything negative in and of itself. I think it's either, you know, well done or poorly done. And um, I, 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 there's this thing you see in the Lies of Locke the Mora where I use an awful lot of it for shock value. It's just there, and it's it's there as sort of a punctuation. You know, fuck is the comma of the Lies of Locke the Mora. Um, I, I, with with my second and third book and everything you know that's going to be developing onward, I, I'm trying to set the bar a little bit higher, um, you know, so that the the vulgarity remains, the roughness remains, um, but I want to put these words together in interesting and exciting new combinations that make people you know giggle and titter rather than simply say, oh, he said fuck, this must be a serious gritty work of of adult fantasy, um, you know. Ev eventually, shock tactics lose their shock, and then what have you got? But um, a well constructed motherfuck insult is a joy forever. And so that's probably going to be quoted on the internet. Oh well. <laughs> a lot of the threats that the characters were using as well, you know, quite a lot of threats to certain parts of the male anatomy. <laughs> well, we are stupid enough to, you know, hang our genitals on the outside, so we kind of get what's coming to us. Um, you know, they're they are they 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 do, they do make good targets for skull duggery, and if you're going to threaten a dude, well, you know, that's the way it goes. Yeah, and then um, you know. On the subject of the violence, and I mean, there was a lot of, you know, I guess there was a lot of gruesome scenes, um, some really creative ways of, yeah, torturing and killing people. So, how did you come up with some of those? I mean, did you do research, and were some of these real <laughs> things an that had been lot of used? Who deeply regretted their critiques of my early manuscripts. Let's just say, like, pardon me, like, my my nerd hat is making my hair look stupider than usual. So, give me one second. Oh, so sure thing. <clears throat> <laughs> you were all like a, a Pantene commercial. I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's like crowding in, and you were all slowly you know, vanishing between the shutters. Let's all get into uh, it later. Because <laughs> you're worth it, Scott. You're worth it. Maybe he's born uh, with it. <laughs> what the fuck was I even talking? Okay, the violence. The violence. Okay. Um, well, you, you, you can't really have a gangster movie without violence. And the, 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 the thing is, is that... Um, Everything I write is kind of a reaction against sanitized, stylized, um, set piece, um, anodyne fantasy. Anodyne is, is the word I, I constantly refer to it as. Um, you know, the the uh, the the sort of cleaned up version of violence where nobody ever bleeds, nobody ever gets infected, nobody ever shits themselves. I mean, it's possible to go way too far in that direction. But when you sanitize violence, you are caricaturing violence. Now you have something like a G.I. Joe cartoon. In a G.I. Joe cartoon, thousands and thousands of people shoot lasers at each other for half an hour, but nobody ever gets hit. Um, all the good guys can dodge the lasers. Um, <laughs> cars get blown up. People don't actually get hurt. So you get this absolutely perverted and um, inhumane version of violence that is nothing like the consequences of actual violence. So simply showing the consequences of violence that people bleed and hurt and that, that this will really fuck people up, I, I think is... is this is going to sound awfully like I'm patting myself on the back, but you know sometimes simply being blunt about things is a revolutionary act. 
Um, and I, I just, I can't stand that stately sort of, you know, there will be no death in this book, except for one character who dies in a very dignified fashion off scene, uh, you know, at the end of book three, uh, there he goes. Um, you know, that's not consequence. That's not humanity. That's, that's not the tapestry of, of our lives and our conflicts. Um, so I, I've got to get the knives and it's got to be lots and lots of murder. Murder is my bread. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us were all stunned when we read that, you know, towards the end and then... Callo, Galdo, Bug, you know, they all got killed off. I'm like, Locke's gang, it's just decimated. Um, they're in a better place, is what no, I tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Shona and I had a big chat about this, um, and we were a little bit disturbed with the torture techniques. Um, one of them, for example, was breaking glass into a canvas bag and putting the bag That's over That's extraordinarily head creepy. And then rubbing yeah. the glass into their face until the bag became blood soaked. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you sadistic bastard. <laughs> How my elementary school that? was a little bit fucked up. I don't know what to say. No, actually, the. <laughs> The um, I, I'm I'm an amateur World War II historian, and the thing is, is that if you if you ever read anything really cheerful and uplifting, like the history of the Gestapo and its interrogation <laughs> techniques, there is some shit in those books. I mean, that I will not put in fiction simply because it's it's absolutely too horrifying. Yeah. Um, the thing about the okay, the thing about the bottles in the broken bottles in, in the in the burlap sack. Um, yeah. I don't actually have a, a a historical precedent for that. I think I made that one up, and That's I don't know what's going <laughs> <laughs> Other other than broken glass is scary. Um, you know, it was it was it was just one of those things that you know I've got one right here. I keep one in my garage. Uh, ooh. Um, no, it was it was just um, it, once again it was just it was puncturing that nice guy bubble. You know, you have these. Oh, that's an excellent, excellent thousand yard stare, Maud. Um, <laughs> just a sec. I have an I have a note. Okay, love you. Um, the uh, it, it's 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 part of that puncturing the uh, the total identification with the protagonists in their world. Um, you know, you you you, you want to get involved with these gangsters who are cool and stylish, and they have flair, and they have humor, and they have camaraderie. But then you find out what their jet day job actually involves. You find out what their world is actually like. Kappa Barsavi and his sons and daughters, and their world. I mean, they're all very cool and stylish, until you see him, you know, feeding his buddies to a shark to get an answer out of them. Until you see this torture taking place. Yeah. Um, it's it's just it, it's all part of providing that simultaneous. It's, it's meant to be disturbing. Um, it's it's meant to to bring questions in, into the reader's mind. You know, my God, I'm enjoying this. Why am I enjoying this? I'm I'm invested in these characters. Why am I invested in these characters? They're fucking killers. Um, it's it's a cruel world, and yeah. you know that's. <laughs> That's, That's why actually I a good was point. seeing them as good bad guys and bad bad guys. That's mm -hmm. the thing. Like you've made us fall in love with these characters that we have actually no reason to like them. They steal. <laughs> they pretend to be, you know, priests and for a from a church organization, <laughs> so they can rip people off and live lavishly. You know, they become other people. They're fulfilled with deceit, and yet we're rooting for them. And I was kind of thinking, um, and Shona and I spoke about this as well in great detail. I remember thinking. If this was written in any other person's point of view, we would be on their side. So if this is in the Basavi's kind of point of view, you know, when his children died, we would be gutted. And, you know, when he was beating up who we thought was the Grey King, we would be so elated. But because it was really locked, we're like, what are you doing? So it's a weird thing where like, if you just kind of twist and just turn it, like if you were reading the book from the Grey King's point of view, like you kind of see exposition from him and you know that he's had a really horrific childhood and his whole life is based on vengeance, you know. And so when he kind of finally got it, if you'd read the book from his perspective, you'd be like, yay, kill the bloody gentleman's bastards. They're no good anyway. So I think it's fantastic that whatever point of view we're reading this from, we root for them. But every single kind of character has their own story of vengeance and, you know, their own kind of rise and fall. Well, that you know, that's that's the secret of writing a good, you know, quote unquote villain, a good antagonist, is that they think they're the protagonist of their own story, and that's absolutely yeah. what you know, 
uh, that, that's what the Beranji twins and, and what their, their older brother, I mean, that's what they all think. This is their story from their perspective. And the reason I, I put that final revelation of where they'd come from and what they were, why they were doing this at the very end was to have one final head-spinning mindfuck, you know, rather than, rather than supplying all that information, you know, I, I wanted the reader to feel the feels of, of Locke's triumph and John's triumph and then give them the full story and once again have that, oh, oh... Can't this author let us be happy for even a fucking minute? Yeah, it, it, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not the, what is it with this guy? <laughs> right, and um, Max Lindstragos in the second book is is you know very much the same thing. He's a total jackass. Um, I agree philosophically with some of the things he says about the Magi. <laughs> yeah, but you're definitely not afraid to let your characters suffer. I learned that very quickly. <laughs> Are you talking about the second book still? No, no, oh, no still, I mean, it could Sorry. be both. I guess. It, wasn't a, it wasn't a spoiler, <laughs> all is well. It, it's not a spoiler when I say there are assholes in my books. <laughs> no, not at all. No, no, not a chance. Warning, um, contains asshole. Uh, just reminding everyone that we are taking questions from you guys if you are watching this one. We've had a few come in already, and I just want to uh, bring up what Jacob Santos has been saying. Uh, okay. He said, it's so great to hear that even great authors have the time when they wrote terribly. All the stuff that I'm working on currently is terrible, and given that I'm a programmer, I'm not sure when I'll have the time to spend 10 to 15 years of writing that will be required to actually go well. But on that note, he asks you, how much of the fourth book is currently done? No timeline on release unless it is that far. <laughs> Just estimates on maybe. Haven't I publicly done. vowed that I'm not going to give like actual like this is 76.7 percent done? Um, the, the thing is, is, is that I always want to add a little bit more. So you know, giving a percentage uh, number is always very difficult. Um, I'm I'm really really hope well it will be done before the end of 2014. I'm really hoping that we're looking at the next uh, month or two, but no promises. I was not here. I did not say that. Um, but it's yeah. it's really far along. It's it's I'm I'm very very deeply mired in it. Um, it's uh, and I've been very deeply mired in it for ten fucking uh, twelve fucking years now because I'm older than I I I am older than I realized. Um, <laughs> I because uh, this is the book I originally set out to write. This was this was going to be the novel, and then um, I realized about three pages into the bullshit I was writing that I didn't know these characters well enough, and wanted to step back in time and uh, and spend more time with them. So that's where we got the first three novels. Um, so now I'm I'm finally catching Locke and John up to where I I originally thought we were going to meet them. Um, mm -hmm. Jesus, twelve, thirteen, fourteen years ago now. Wow, um, interesting. So, too long didn't read version is uh, it's beautiful, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone buy the book. <laughs> Got a few no, more questions it's... happening as well. Sorry, just let, let, a lot of people are big fans here. Drew Forbes is one of them. He says, "Ah, oh, Scott, you huge fucking dork. Why aren't you my best friend? There is a huge oh. hole in my life where you are not." Oh. You owe me 50 bucks, dude. Pay up and I'll consider it. <laughs> and we've got Mel Moore who uh, has written in saying, are we going to learn more about the sons as sexual exploits? <laughs> um, well, this is what fanfic is for. Um, We're making you know, I'm, I'm sure We that... know both of those people. <laughs> <laughs> are you doing um... <laughs> The Sans's sexual exploits. <laughs> you're, so you're, you're basically asking me, am I going to ladle more fan service into my future mm. gentleman bastard works? Pardon me for one moment. We want moment. titillating just... and salacious details. Well, I will give them Go. to you in just a moment. Just a moment. I'll be right back. All right. Well, Scott's doing that. We are going to solicit again. If you haven't followed us on Twitter, it is at Gig Bombshells. You can write your comments in there. We are YouTube.com forward slash YouTube is uh, Gig Bombshells too. So make sure you're writing in. Um, and Scott Sorry. Mel has uh, that's all right. She's got part two of the question after she said porn, please, thanks. Uh, she said <laughs> on an even more serious note, what influenced your feminist views and made you so determined to do things right? Um, at some point, I think you, you, you make the discovery that women are actually human beings, and after that, you can kind of never go back. Um, you, you know, I, 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 I think, um, <laughs> I, 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 I just, I, I think that there is a, uh, as I, as I start stuttering, because I haven't answered the Calogaldo sex question yet, which is, which is <laughs> still spinning around inside my mind. 
here um, on look, if you, the dark. Frankly, okay, if, if, you, if you have any interest whatsoever in the absolute equality and dignity of all human beings, then you are a feminist, full stop. And if you attempt to be anything else, then you do not have an interest in the equality and dignity of all human beings. So it, it, at some point, it becomes an urgent fucking moral crusade. Um, I just I, I don't have a lot of patience, and you know I used to have this argument with with my my ex-wife, um, who you know is no is no wilting daisy, is herself a feminist, but actually would not use the word feminist because to her it uh, you know it, it denoted uh, you know crazy people, radicals, bra burners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know I I, I just I, I would have just want to you know this argument with her and, and, and try to explain that um, you know the the word feminist is stigmatized um, by people who are the forces of fucking darkness they stigmatize this word because they're the forces of fucking darkness and if you you, you, you can call yourself whatever you want oh I'm, I'm an equalitarian I'm a humanitarian bullshit you're a feminist because terms like equalitarian and humanitarian imply that there's some sort of existing balance that needs to be preserved whereas you're, you're what you're looking at is essentially one half of the human race is already in the negative and needs to be brought to that state of equality. So if you are for equality, you're a fucking feminist, whether you know it or not. Um, sorry, here endeth the rant. Um, <laughs> um, now about Calo Galdo's sex. They're going to fuck a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> um uh, the, the secret, the terrible <laughs> secret of the sum of the twins is that one of them is actually a bisexual. I've never known how to bring it into the into oh. into the book because yeah. at this point, here's okay. It's 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 a joke and it's a dumb joke. It's always been in background material that one of the Sansas is bisexual and the other gentlemen bastards have never figured out which one it is because the two twins don't talk about it. They conceal this. And the, the the thing is 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 that um, Kamor has problems with uh, it, we, we, more problems with what we would call homophobia. Um, the Eastern Therans have more hang-ups than the Western Northern Therans, and the Vadrans have no fucking hang-ups whatsoever. Um, so Kamor is like not overtly homophobic, but they have some issues yet to work through. You know, you can you can see the uh, Watchmen at the end of Lies of Locke Lamora referring to uh, people as you know bum fanciers and using it in, in a derogatory fashion. Um, so uh, for 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 one of the Sansa twins to sort of out themselves as as you know playing both sides of the equation um, just really isn't done so much in Camor. But if you move. Uh, you know, as as we've seen, if you move uh, 200 miles to the west, if you go uh, to Aspara, it's a perfectly normal thing. Um, and this is getting really long and and boring, so I'm just going to say, yeah, they're going to fuck a unicorn in book five. <laughs> Three at once, <laughs> unicorn. Top of the New York like... Times list. Here I fucking come, unicorns. Uh, yeah. Well, I hope that answers your question. Good lord. Woo! Exciting. Now. Uh, Natalie um, has. But... Oh, that may yeah. never that may never show up in the text. I'm really sorry. I'm 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 still working on it. The subtext. The unicorn strolls past. Maybe dot dot book dot. Twenty. <laughs> um, we've got Natalie Leaf saying, "Uh oh, uh, hi Scott. I mean, Mr. Lynch. I mean, how do you come up with titles? I love your work a lot." That's Mr. Awesome. Lynch is my dad, <laughs> and he would say that Mr. Lynch is his dad. My name is Scott. Um, <laughs> I come up with titles by obsessing on them because I'm a title fixator. I can't, I cannot fucking stand lazy ass titles. Um, so I obsess over them. Uh, they're, they're, they are artistic flourishes. Um, they're very, very important to me. So I spend an inordinate amount of time obsessing over them. That, that, that's how I come up with them. What was the most preliminary uh, titles that you've had for, say, Lies or one of your other books? Well, okay, way back in the day, I thought that the sequel to The Lies of Locke Lamora was going to be called The Best Heretic Ever, um, and it was going to be about Locke and John in a religious scam, um, and Locke and John live a religious scam, but the thing is, I had not mapped out their life enough, I hadn't put the bits with the Temple of Perilandro and um, you know the Crooked Warden um, into the story structure yet, so... Um, when I realized that I'd, I'd already done that, I had to kind of scratch that off the old plot list, um, because that's essentially what they do all the time. Um, the the other thing is is the, is that uh, the t the planned title of book six, which is the Mage and the Master Spy, which I really like, I think it's a really cool title. Um, I just don't know if it fits. Um, I don't know if it's going to fit the situation, um, because there are mages and there is a Master Spy, um, but I don't know if the book is really about them. So 
I may have I to name it something else. Man, it's not unicorn fucking. I mean, that's what we're all expecting. <laughs> Book five. Lots of bisexual three-way unicorn fucking. Top of the New York Times bestseller list. Here I fucking come. Um, uh, I think I'm gonna make T-shirts with that. That's this is what this is what I want. Uh, like I, I need a blurb from somebody famous that says this is like Game of Thrones with a lot more unicorn sex. <laughs> and I, I'm fucking made. I'll be able to buy a private island. It'll be great. I'll never have to hear from you people again. <laughs> Um, the, the title of book seven, Inherit the Night, um, though it was very firmly set. That fucker's staying. I'm never giving that one up. Um, but uh, yeah, book six may get a retitle. Um, book five, Ministry of Necessity, is going to stay exactly where it is. And The Thorn of Ember Lane is, is exactly as it needs to be. Cool. Hey, um, Alexandra and Vera, you guys have been a little bit quiet, and you sent over a few questions um, previously. Yeah, are you feeling okay? Did you guys yeah. want to It's just take the rest the of the day? We're happy to sit here and giggle and roll our eyes at the people that we know. Yeah. <laughs> the stage is yours. Away you go. Scott, Alexandra, Vera. Okay. Um, I think that one of the questions that we asked you already sort of answered. Um, that one was, like, which one was your favorite character and then which one is most fun for you to write? Do you have anything to add to that or do you feel like you already answered that one? Oh, um, well, pretty, pretty undeniable. I mean, I've, I've answered this online, too, but, I mean, it's, it's basically the same answer. Um, Angie Vesta Vorchenza and Zamira Drakash are kind of a tie for fun to write. Um, mm -hmm. Jean, Jean, too, because, like I said, Jean, Jean is the sensible one. Jean is the adult in the relationship. Yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, as, as we've seen with the Republic of Thieves, Locke has grown up a little bit, so now mm -hmm. they both get to be a little more adult. A, a little bit, I promise. I promise. Not, not all the way. Not yet. Um, also, the other one that we were wondering about, um, you touched on this a little bit, telling us that one of the Sansa brothers is bisexual, but we've sort of noticed in um, specifically the first book is that they seem to be written sort of as the same character. We were going to, we were wondering if you were planning on sort of individualizing them in future books. Well, I, I mean, as you can see, I, I, I started out trying to... Well, they dress differently. They're totally not the same action figure. What are you talking about? Um, so one of them has a black ninja costume. One of them has a white ninja costume. What more do you want? Oh, totally um, different. Um, really different. The, well, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is is that, you know, I've, I've, I've known several sets of identical twins. There was a point when I was... When my, my U16 soccer team had three sets of identical twins, and it was the best fucking thing ever because you could see the confusion on the faces of the team. <laughs> because, you know, dude would pass to himself, and then another dude would pass <laughs> to himself, and everyone would just, you know, be like, I'm drunk. Um, and and the, the thing I notice in my, in my personal experience is that, is that you know, um, twins tend to go through phases. You know, they, they develop separately, they develop closely, they develop separately, they develop closely, etc. Um, they go through phases where they differentiate themselves um, very fiercely from one another. And they go through phases where they play that game with the world of tell us apart, motherfuckers, we dare you. And I wanted the Sansas to drift through those, these phases of their life. Um, the adult Sansas that we see have sort of settled on a default Sansa identity. I mean, they're both very comfortable in their own skins. Um, they're they're just they're not terribly differentiated because they're not being jerks to each other. When we meet the teenage Sansas, um, you know, in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Gentlemen Bastards, they are very much at a. Uh, I mean, they're at one of those friction points where they can't stand being around each other. You know, so they are they're doing their best to you know differentiate themselves physically, emotionally. They're not fucking getting along. So you know, one of them is bald. One of them is, you know, properly, gloriously long-haired, like a normal human being would be. Um, they, uh, in, 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 in book five, we are definitely going to see more of them and more of what I think will be their most evolved version of their adult personality, um, simply because um, the guy writing that book is a little bit older than the guy who wrote Lies and will work a little bit harder at differentiating them. Cool. Jesus, You're every answer I give <laughs> <laughs> Every so answer I give comes back to I'm old now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can hear, I can going. feel the breath of the grave on the back of my neck. What more do you children want from me? <laughs> uh, and some of us were not that far behind, so why it makes me very worried for my future. <laughs> not too far away. <laughs> uh, the third question that yeah, we we're had not as young as we think we are. Call me when you hit. 23, Maude. What, what, what are you? Like, 20... I'm kidding. 
I am 55. It's so sweet. That's a lovely <laughs> thing to say. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Next, next question. But it totally derailed us. What, 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 no what, um, what else can so I tell the you? The third question that we had was sort of a sort of a theory discussion question for the whole group. Um, do you guys think that the Elder Glass Towers are remnants of an ancient civilization or beacons for summoning Lovecraftian horrors from an outer dimension <laughs> or whatever Scott's doing with this? Thoughts? Ah. Because my theory. It's totally built by aliens, and I want you to picture me as that crazy guy from the History Channel when I say aliens. <laughs> it could be alien. <laughs> aliens. <laughs> Fucking magnets, how do they work? <laughs> aliens. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned Lovecraft. If you look in the background of my thing here, there's a big giant Cthulhu plushie. So there you go. Awesome. I also have a <laughs> Oh, there's yeah, there's there's some Lovecraft in my background. I mean, I, I like to think that you know, I mean, especially in in Republic of Thieves, if you listen to um, Patience's story and you see the things under the, I mean, I'm a big fan of the whole you know, um, hiding things in dark dark things, hiding in dark corners, waiting to do dark things. Um, yeah. You know, I'm 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 a big appreciator. Um, as for what the Elder Glass actually is. Um, it's actually really simple, and I can probably tell you um, straightforwardly. And it's uh, shit. I'm sorry. I hit a button. It's really that simple. <laughs> I was like, "What?" It's, it's, it's as easy as that. And then, okay, he's doing that on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I must have pushed a button. The audio went all you know floofy for a moment. Um, you know, but really I don't want funny. to repeat myself. Yeah, it's so funny. I think so. Um, yeah. I'm not gonna weigh in. I'm not gonna offer any commentary on this. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, photos, like, uh, the elder glass was just beyond really cool. Offered, I, Truth. Um, <laughs> what, what, did you really... expect a straightforward answer from me? Have you ever read the fucking books? Um, <laughs> no, I. Uh, this is one of those things. I'm. I'm very content to let other people speculate because you all abuse me so much. And then you just laugh and go, "Ha ha, so wrong." It's adorable. I love it. I love it. I really like watching people deconstruct the books. And um, you know what? Some of you are surprisingly sharp. And some of you have no idea what the fuck is going on. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I fear for you. You may need professional help. Um, but, you know, I, I, I love you all equally, my children. Um, oh. yeah, that, that, is, that, is, that is one of the untrammeled pleasures of, of these, these books has been watching people dissect them um, in public and sometimes say some very, very astute things. Um, and sometimes just totally get it wrong, but get it wrong plausibly, um, which which is just fascinating to me. Hmm. I um, I've got glass. a question. I have no idea how bad my lag is. Is my lag really bad? Right? I got Whoa. dropped out. You you did. You may have just dropped again. There's your. <laughs> sorry, Maud. There's your answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And she's gone. Well, we could just um, with the elder she glass. She asked I mean, too many questions about elder glass kids. That's what happened. Oh, oh well. <laughs> so maybe I should stop then, because <laughs> it wasn't really till the third book that I started thinking that it could be anything else. I mean, I just thought this sounds really pretty, like false light and all of that. I want that in my city, Melbourne, and build elder glass. <laughs> <laughs> but then the third book, there are these hints, and I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah. Um, we have a, a fan chat room, and one of the people from the chat room who's there all the time has this really like deep and elaborate theory about the relationship between Elder Glass and Wraithstone, and he's written like five pages on the subject, and I don't know if I believe it or not, but it's an awesome theory. <laughs> it is a good theory. <laughs> it's a very good one. It's a thorough one. It is, it's thorough, is what it is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was praising with faint damnation, or damning with faint praise. <laughs> <laughs> It's wow. There's a lot of words in this theory. It's very impressive. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I. It would not be fair of me to drop any more hints than I already have online because this is one of those long con type things where I just really hope you'll you'll be on the edge of your seat for all seven or fourteen books, um, waiting for the answer whether or not it's ever going to come. Further deponent saith not. Okay, Maud, are you back? Okay, I think I'm back again. I'm not sure. 
I don't know. I don't know what's happening. My internet hurts me. But um, really quickly, I thought we'd just do the last question because we have reached our hour with Scott. Um, but we do have a great one in from Drew, uh, who complimented you earlier and said you are never getting that fifty bucks back. You should have known better than to trust me. He also said something I know a lot uh, of aspiring writers struggle with is that you start out with a cast. You have the overall idea of where the story is starting and where it's ending, but then. Oh God, now I have to figure out the middle, what am I even doing with my life? I should have been a lawyer, I'm a creative hack, I'll never be Scott Lynch. Writing is a very existential struggle. So my question is, how do you personally manage that middle space? Or are you like Terry Pratchett who says, fuck an outline, let's start writing? <laughs> um, okay, the first thing you got to realize is it's not just you. It's every fucking writer who lives. Every fucking writer who lives at some point during a lengthy project goes through this. It's it's like the stages of grieving um, in a totally different order. It's like you know, first you pr you proceed from excitement to loathing to ridiculous um, omni loathing. You know, I, I'm not merely failing this project. I am the worst fucking writer who has ever dared to uh, touch a keyboard in human history. I am the least sentient human being on the face of the planet. Planet. I'm a fraud. I'm a sham, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and you know, if a bunch of authors were listening to this at the moment, they'd all be nodding like this. And it happens to all of us. It is a perfectly normal feeling. Um, you spend a lot of time. First off, you're spending a lot of time mired in your own head. Um, you're, you're, you're inside a. a you're having no human contact. You're doing this all alone. You are staring into a computer monitor and, and the white space inside your head are your only company. So first off, you're cut off from sensation. You're cut off from feedback. And all you have in this little room is your hopes and aspirations and self-loathing. Then you throw yourself into a project that may last God knows how long and it's only natural for you to start evolving a sort of uh, you know uh, love-hate relationship with it. So we all pass through these phases where we're like, oh Jesus, I've lost it. I've lost my gift. I've lost whatever made me special. Everyone fucking does it. It's not just you. The key is just to keep writing because you are not acting. You are not an objective judge of your own emotional state or artistic capacity while you are actually working on it. Um, you are a little bit fucked in the head when you are grappling with something of this enormity. Um, it's 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 not you. It's just the work. It's just the way we are wired, um, and it happens to all of us. And you just keep going. You can keep going. It will look different once you are through the other side. Whatever the other side happens to be, the next chapter, the end of the book, whatever, um, it will look different once you push through to it. So just fucking keep typing. It's the only solution. Yeah, I can that second that. That's, that's happened to me with basically every artistic project I've ever yeah. embarked on, writing, cosplay. Yeah, you're... Your relationship with your, with your your Sabbath address isn't is actually like the platonic ideal of the I'm the coolest cosplayer ever. I'm a fraud. I deserve to be in Finland. Vera yeah, kill me. Just, okay, maybe yeah, I exaggerate. Just... <laughs> but yeah. Do you have to deal with um I guess feelings of like imposter syndrome or anything like that? No, everybody, everybody does. We all, we all do all the goddamn time. Um, there, there's just the, the thing is, is that uh, the the thing we dreamed of. You know, the, you, you tell yourself, I want to be a famous writer someday. I want to be a successful writer. And you, you, you think of the pantheon of writers that, um, you know, you, you want to emulate. You know, somebody. I want to be like Ray Feist or Neil Gaiman. I want to be like Ellen Kushner. I want to be, you know, uh, like Jenny Wirtz, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I want to be like Scott Lynch because I have taste and ambition to spare. Um, <laughs> you know. Think of these things, and then you know eventually you do become a writer, and they become your you know business associates. Communication with them ceases to be this incredibly rare thing, and it just becomes this quotidian thing. Like, oh, there's another here's another email from my good buddy Pat Rothfuss. He wants to get together and do good buddy stuff. <laughs> Pat, call me. No, um, you know it it it, so it sounds like fucking name dropping, but you know we we work together in the same professional field, and everybody feels like this. And I still you know, there there are certain stick up their ass types who imagine that we should all maintain some sort of artificially professional demeanor when we talk to each other, you know, never let on that you like another writer's work, but that's fucking bullshit. We all still, Bear and myself, Pat Rothfuss, everybody, we all, Neil Gaiman, I guarantee, we all melt into puddles when we meet people who are important and influential to us. We all do the, oh my god, I can't <laughs> oh. we, we, And 
you know what? That's one of life's joys, and it's one of the, honestly the most important things you can ever do with somebody who's been artistically and emotionally important to you is to say, "I love your work. You've been very important to me." Now I'm going to let you continue with your meal before security drags me off. Um, but yeah, the, the imposter syndrome thing and the "I can't believe this is my life" thing is one of those things that never stops. Um, we just, you know, it hits you at random, um, and you just uh, again, you just have to fucking deal with it. It's it's weird. Um, it's a problem you want to have, um, yeah. <laughs> but but it's it's there. It's omnipresent. You know, it's it's part of the whole artistic self-loathing cycle. Um, the, the, yeah, the thought, as 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 Bear puts it, you know, the thought that someday, real soon, somebody's going to discover that you're not a real writer. It's all been a mistake. So they're going to knock on your door and they're going to take all the novels away and all the awards and all the money and leave and give it to the person who should have gotten them. Um, it's, it's it's just an illusion, it, and it happens to us all. Good to know. <laughs> this is what I you have to look forward to if you want to be a writer. Great. Sorry. Thanks. No, I'm like Sorry. As well. <laughs> I was just I was just gonna say, you know what? Time's up. We've had amazing good questions. We had a big chat about the book. Scott, I'm so glad we ended up doing this. A better late than never. We did try it a couple of weeks ago. It was an electrical storm. But uh, thank you so much for joining on the panel. Everyone else, all the other panelists, thank you so much. Um, really love that you got involved with this one. Shona, Tegan, Vera, Alexandra. Thank you guys so much. Um, if you are just tuning in at the end and you've missed out all the big Beginning. Don't worry, this video will be made uh, available to watch from the very beginning anytime you like. And uh, Scott, if you do get a little bit bored and you want to visit this video maybe in a week or so and see questions that we may have missed and pop in an answer, we'd really, really appreciate that. Um, sorry that my internet has been a downright piece of shit, uh, but these things happen. And Scott, while I've got you, um, you confessed something to me which was really, really sweet, and that was you are a big fan of my uncle's band called Midnight Oil and that you used to listen to Midnight Oil when you were a kid? Well, um, he wants and, to and say... Oh, yeah, okay, well, he wants to say a big hi to you. He says, keep up the great work. If you're writing a book that I like enough to get you on a panel and to talk about, then he said it must be pretty good. And so, oh, yeah. thank you. He's really thrilled. Well, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that, that you're not, like, you know, living, um, you know, in, in, in like, Estrangement from your weird uncle Pete and his his crazy band. Um, so that's no, that's just, that's just totally awesome. I'm a huge, I'm a huge fucking Midnight Oil fanboy from way back when, and um, I hope they all live forever. <laughs> and I think Maud might have just dropped out again. No, <laughs> so, no, we killed yeah. Maud again. Oh, no. Okay, <laughs> but I think yeah, we Good. can wrap Good. Now up. we rule the channel and can do as we please for hours and hours, <laughs> and everyone is our prisoner. So let's get back to unicorn sex with Calo and Galdo. Oh. <laughs> I, I wonder if I wonder if she's she properly recorded that part if she's gonna find this out after the fact. Oh, this will be on YouTube. This is going up on YouTube whether she was there or not. Episode thirty six, Unicorn Sex with Calo and Galdo. A bag full of glass on people's heads. <laughs> So, yeah, I think, um, so for those guys uh, watching, you can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash geekbomb, and we're on Twitter at geekbombshells, and of course the website is geekbomb.net. And I think, Maud, are you there? Any final words to wrap us up? And, no, maybe she's frozen again. So, yes, anyway, thank you so much again, Scott, for joining us. It has been a lot of fun. And thank you to everyone who's been watching, sending questions, and, of course, to our panelists. Okay, Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for putting up with my bullshit. Um, I'm going to go off to this convention now and drink like a proper author, <laughs> which is a, a nasty stereotype, but true in my, in my case. So. <laughs> All right, we'll have fun with that. See you guys.